because a lot of people are sitting back and they're thinking, well, I'm going to go to the airlines. All the airlines fly multi-engine airplanes, so why do I even need my single-engine commercial rating if I'm never going to exercise those privileges? And that's actually a, a good question. You're listening to the VSL Aviation Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lake, and this is episode 20. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching if you're on YouTube. Today, I'm pretty excited because we're starting the series on the multi-engine rating. And you might know this, you might not, but I specialize in the multi-engine rating. Here at VSL, that's uh, the main rating that we do. We do about four of those a week. I've given hundreds of multi-engine check rides and flown thousands of hours in multi-engine aircraft. And I just love everything about it. So I'm excited to talk about this one. Uh, it's also going to be a little different format. We're actually going to talk about the training requirements because that's a question that gets asked a lot uh, is what type of training is required to get your multi-engine, specifically the multi-engine add-on rating. Uh, and then we're probably going to get into the beginning stages of the ACS. It'll be at least a two or three part episode uh, or series on the multi-engine rating. So on this first one, we'll get through the training requirements and the first part of the Airman Certification Standards. Now, another thing that I'd like to cover at the top of the show is that I've just launched my Patreon and I've got some ways that you can support the show on the website, vsl.aero slash podcast. Um, this is a listener supported content and I really want to keep it that way. And I'm not saying I'm going to stop producing content unless you give me money. That's not it at all. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to keep, um, producing this content to help you be a better pilot and help you prepare for your check ride. But it does help me, uh, create content, uh, more often if I get some support to offset some of the costs here, primarily my time, because every hour I spend in front of you doing these videos is one less hour I can spend flying airplanes and making money, which is how uh, I make my living out here. So I would really appreciate it if you consider um, contributing to the show a little bit. Uh, join the Patreon. Patreon just came out with this cool feature, um, Patreon video. So here in the very near future, I'm going to produce some content that will only be available there. And one of those pieces of content is going to be kind of a, a master class type format of getting you prepared for your check ride. So I'll actually get into more detail on how check rides are given and some of the rules and regulations behind those on top of what I've already covered in the ACS. So you may check out my Patreon channel for stuff like that. And then I also have released my interactive airman certification standards, which you're going to see me using here in a little bit, uh, but you can see them on previous episodes. So those are available to purchase on the website. And then you also get both the commercial and the instrument ACS uh, if you sign up for, for Patreon. Whereas if you go to the website and you buy them individually, you get about a 50% discount if you go on Patreon and you get both of those. So if you haven't taken your instrument check right and you're studying, uh, I, would, I would really look into doing that. And so I think it's a good deal. It's a useful tool that, that's built there. So without further ado, let's get started on the multi-engine rating. So the first website I'm going to pull up is uh, the ECFR. Now on, uh, on the ECFR, I like to use this because this is the source data for all the FARs is ecfr.gov. So I've got that pulled up and I've kind of drilled down. We're in Title 14, that's Aviation and Aerospace, Chapter 1, Subchapter D, Part 61, Subpart B, and then Part 63. So 6163 is how we'd refer, refer to this. And 6163 covers additional aircraft ratings. So in paragraph B there, it, it covers, you know, paragraph A is just the general stuff. And then paragraph B talks about an additional aircraft category rating and an additional aircraft class rating. So let's talk about those for a second because I think there's a little bit of confusion there, especially if you're new um, to, to aviation. There's category, class, and type. Kind of those are the broad spectrums uh, of aircraft that we have. So a category of aircraft, that's airplane is a category. Helicopter is a category. Airship, uh, balloon, those are all types of categories, right? Now, the, the level down from category, you have the class. So airplane being the category, single engine is the class, or multi-engine is the class. So airplane, multi-engine is the category, airplane, multi-engine, class. So if we already hold a commercial single engine rating, right, a commercial airplane single engine, and we want to add our commercial airplane multi-engine, then we're adding a class, not a category. 
Now that matters because let's read through here. Uh, in paragraph B, if we're adding a category, here's what we have to do. We have to complete the training uh, and have the applicable aeronautical experience. That sounds like a little bit of word salad, but that really matters because what that's referencing is back to uh, further in 61 where it defines what you need to do for your multi-engine rating in part 61. That's a lot of training compared to if you're just adding the class. So let's let's finish the category, right? We're thinking of category. So you have to complete the uh, training and have the applicable aeronautical experience. Must have a logbook and training record endorsement from an authorized instructor. Must pass the practical practical test and need not take additional knowledge test provided the applicant holds an airplane rotorcraft, powered lift, weight shift control, powered parachute, or airship rating at the private at the pilot certificate level. So the way I remember this is just powered to powered, right? So if you have a powered rating and you're adding a powered rating, you don't need to take a test. If you have a non-powered rating, which would be a glider. So let's say you have a commercial glider certificate and you want to add airplane commercial certificate, then you're going to have to take an additional exam. That's probably less common than the other way around where, like myself, I hold an ATP commercial rating and single engine. If I wanted to go get my glider rating, I'm going to have to take a written exam. Even though I already hold a commercial, I hold a commercial empowered. And so if you're going from powered to non-powered, you got to take a test. Or if you're going from non-powered to powered, you have to take a test. If you're going powered to powered, don't need a test. So if we're adding a category, there's all the things that we have to do. Now, if we're just adding the class, it must have a logbook or training record endorsement from an authorized instructor, must pass the practical test, need not meet the specified training time requirements prescribed by this part, okay? Um unless the person only holds a lighter than air category rating with a balloon class rating and seeking airship class rating. I won't go into that because that's all balloonatic stuff. And then paragraph four, need not take an additional knowledge test. So that's a big difference, right? Because I don't have to meet the training requirements that are outlined in part 61. I don't have to take a written exam. I just need a logbook and training record endorsement from an authorized instructor. So there's basically no time requirements required if you have a single engine commercial rating and you want to add your multi-engine commercial rating. There is no time requirements. All that you have to do is have a logbook and training record endorsement from an authorized instructor. It's really common to hear that there's a three-hour training requirement. Um, this rule has changed over time. Used to, yes, you did have to have uh, three hours of training in the previous two calendar months. To qualify for a test that's still an endorsement that's given but it's no longer for for all ratings or let me rephrase that for some ratings the three hours is still a thing uh, but that's not the case for all the ratings so there's no time requirement bottom line there's no time requirement you just have to have the training now three hours is is probably the bare bones minimum uh, i would say on average you're going to need about seven hours of training um, seven to 10 hours of training to get your multi-engine add-on if you hold a single engine commercial. Uh, the same goes as if you hold a private pilot commercial and you're adding a, a private pilot multi-engine rating. It's about the same. It's almost the same identical check reg. So part B, adding a category, who does this apply to? So most of the people, I'd say eight out of 10 people are Paragraph C, folks, they're adding a class, right? You hold a single engine commercial rating and you're getting your multi-engine commercial. I'd say 90% of our clients that come through VSL are commercial pilots and they're adding their multi-engine rating onto a commercial single engine rating. Uh, about 10% um, are coming to us for an added category. So what an added category is, and I would, I'll, again, I'll give you the most common one is that's our, our helicopter friends, our rotorcraft friends that have maybe started their career as a private pilot helicopter. They moved up to a, a commercial helicopter pilot, instrument rated. They've been flying helicopters a lot. They might have a single engine private uh, pilot certificate, but nothing higher than that. And they're ready to move on to the airlines. So in that case, they have to meet all the training requirements in Part 61. So let's look at that real quick. So we're going to go back, navigate to part 61, aeronautical experience, 61, part 129. And we're just going to focus in on the commercial. I think 90% uh, of my viewers and listeners are probably looking to add on their commercial multi-engine rating. 
Uh, those of you that want to add your private pilot multi-engine rating, I would say that's marginally beneficial. The thing that, uh, well, let me step back. I would suggest getting your private pilot multi-engine rating if you own a multi-engine aircraft, right? If you don't own a multi-engine aircraft, I think all you're doing is you're kind of, you're spending time and money getting another rating that you're going to have to take another check ride anyway. So you're basically volunteering to take one extra check ride, which is is more costly and it takes more time and I don't think it's really necessary. So you don't ever need really to get your private pilot multi-engine rating. You can go straight to commercial after you, you've gotten all your single engine ratings. So focus on getting your single engine ratings first and let the multi-engine rating be kind of the last rating that you get after you're already a commercial pilot. If you get it when you're a, a, a private pilot, that's great. But all that means is when you get a commercial pilot, you're going to have to take another multi-engine check ride to commercial standards. So that's that's that extra check ride I was referring to. You're just forcing yourself to take an extra check ride. So in 61.129, that defines the aeronautical experience for the commercial rating. And you can see that paragraph A, so the very first paragraph in 61.129, is titled for an airplane single engine rating. Well, we don't care about that because we're here to talk about multi-engine. So we actually have to go down to paragraph B. So you go down to paragraph B, now an airplane multi-engine rating. And the first thing it says is, except as provided in paragraph I of this um, section, uh, a person has to have basically 250 hours of total time. I'm not going to sit here and read the entire FARs for you. I'm going to try to abbreviate as best I can. So you need 250 hours. Uh, you need 100 hours in powered aircraft, 50 of which have to be in airplanes. Uh, 100 hours of pilot in command uh, includes 50 in airplanes and 50 cross country. Okay. So, so far it hasn't specified multi or single. It's just saying airplanes. So it's only given us category ratings of which at least 10 hours must be in airplanes, and then 20 hours of training in the specified areas include 10 hours of instrument training and in using a view limiting device, five hours of the 10 hours required on the instrument training must be in a multi-engine airplane. So finally, we've gotten to a multi-engine requirement. It's finally drilled down. So we need 20 hours of training, 10 has to be instrument, five of those 10 have to be in a multi-engine airplane. Um, so there's five hours required training. Then, uh, the next subparagraph is 10 hours of training in a multi-engine complex or turbine powered airplane, or for seeking a multi-engine seaplane rating, 10 hours of training in a multi-engine seaplane. Um, it goes into some other minutia there, but basically big picture, this is another 10 hours that we need. So we need 10 hours of training in a multi-engine complex, uh, airplane. Now, the paragraph above that was talking about 10 hours of instrument training, and five of the 10 hours of instrument training have to be done in a multi. This paragraph just says 10 hours of training. So really, the five hours that it talked about above could be nested into this. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. So really, all you're looking at in, in paragraph 3i and ii is really 10 hours of training, not 15 right? Because it's five hours of instrument training and, and 10 hours of multi-engine complex training. Well, we can nest that five hours in that, in that subset of 10 hours of training. So, so far we're just at 10 hours of training. Uh, one two hour cross country in a multi-engine airplane has distance requirements on there. And one two hour cross country flight in a multi-engine airplane at night has some distance requirements. And then three hours in a multi-engine airplane with an authorized instructor uh, in the preceding two calendar months. So there's our three hours in the previous two calendar months. All of those, that's one, two, three, four, five paragraphs in subpart three there. All five paragraphs, That's you can total them up. It's only 10 hours of training in a multi-engine aircraft. Now it's 20 hours of training total, but, but 10 of the 20 hours could be done in a single engine airplane. So we're, we're just at 10 hours of training so far. So baseline, 10 hours was required so far. But then, subparagraph 4, it says 10 hours of solo flight time in a multi-engine airplane. Or 10 hours of flight time performing the duties of pilot and command in a multi-engine airplane with an authorized instructor. So here's another 10 hours. So, I, so right now, we're at 20 hours of training. So per the FAR, if you're adding a category... At a minimum, you're going to need 20 hours of training or 20 hours of flight time in a multi-engine aircraft. 10 is going to be training, 10 
are going to be solo. So when does this apply to you? Well, as we talked about before, if you're adding a category, so if you're coming from Rotorcraft and you're adding a multi-engine category, comes into play there. If you're doing this as your initial commercial, then it comes into play. When would you do, so when would you skip single engine commercial? Who is that the right answer for? And I get this question a lot because a lot of people are sitting back and they're thinking, well, I'm going to go to the airlines. All the airlines fly multi-engine airplanes. So why do I even need my single engine commercial rating if I'm never going to exercise those privileges? And that's actually a, a good question because you're right. Most commercial pilots will never exercise their privileges as a single engine commercial pilot. Most people will go straight to the airlines, which are all multi-engine, of course, and you're never going to use your single engine rating. In fact, a lot of my coworkers in the Air Force that are flying for major airlines like FedEx and Delta and Southwest, they still don't have their single engine commercial rating. They've never gotten it because they never flew a single engine airplane in their entire career. Right? The Air Force used to, you would do your primary training in the T-37, which was a twin engine turbojet. And then you would move to the T-38, which is a twin engine turbojet. And then you would move to your aircraft, which all of them are twin engines, minus, you know, an F-16 here or there. Um, but in like the C-130 world, we have a lot of pilots that don't have a single engine rating at all. They don't have a single, single engine rating. It's all multi-engine. So it's not required. I'll agree with you there. So why does everybody get their single engine commercial and then get their multi-engine commercial? Why doesn't everybody just go straight to multi-engine commercial? Well, the answer is kind of an economic answer having to do with the rules that we just read. If you go straight to your multi-engine commercial, you are going to have to spend 20 hours with an instructor and 20 hours in a multi-engine airplane. Um, so let's, let's do some quick math. So I've got calculator pulled up. Let's just do some quick math here. Uh, let's say, I would say the average, national average for renting a multi-engine aircraft is $400. And then the national average for uh, an instructor in a multi-engine aircraft is about $70. So we're looking at $470 an hour. And again, this is on average. You'll be able to find schools that are much cheaper than this and probably a lot of schools that are a lot more expensive. But let's just assume $470 an hour. So if we do 470 times 10... That's $4,700 for the 10 hours of training, right? So that's the 10 hours of training. Now we have to do 10 hours of solo. We're like, well, that's only going to be $400 an hour. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do that math. We'll, we'll do $400 an hour um, times 10. So that's 4000 So 4000 plus 4700 is $8,700 for a multi-engine rating. And we, we didn't add in the check right in there. So let's, let's say another... Um, well, that would be another $400 uh, for the aircraft because it's going to be at least an hour-long check ride probably. And uh, I'll, do, I'll do $700. That's what I normally charge. We're at $9,800. Well, probably well, round number, we'll just say $10,000. So $10,000 for your commercial check ride. Now, I used $400 an hour for that solo time. The problem is, good luck finding a school that's going to rent you an airplane to actually fly around for 10 hours solo. You're just not going to be able to do that in today's insurance environment. That's just that's just the truth. I'm being straight with you here. I insure uh, five multi-engine aircraft, and all of those insurance policies say in order for me to rent to you solo, you're going to have to have 20 hours in type just to qualify. 20 hours in type, and they want you to have 50 hours of multi-engine in, in category, so in multi-engine airplanes. So you need to have 50 hours of, of multi-engine time and then 20 hours in type. I do get a, a kind of a carve-out for that where we could do it as little as 25 hours. So if you do an authorized program with us with an instructor for 25 hours, then I can rent with you solo. So basically you can't rent the airplane solo. So really, you're going to have to do the 10 hours of doing PIC duties with an authorized instructor on board, right? That's a legal thing for you to do. There's an endorsement for it. In uh, 6165H, it talks about uh, basically giving a, uh, you can fly with an instructor as, as doing the duties of PIC as long as that instructor is not, not teaching you. You know, they're not instructing. And you can't dual log that time. 
So don't try to get cute with the rules and say, well, I need 10 hours of training and then I'm going to fly this at the same time, my 10 hours with an authorized instructor. And that way I only have to do 10 total. No, it doesn't work that way. It specifically says you can't log the hours when you're, when you have an instructor on board and you're logging PIC duties, doing the duties of the PIC that can also be logged as dual received. So it's going to be 20 hours and it's all going to be at that, uh, $4,700 dollar or uh, $470 an hour. So really we're looking at 470 times 20, 9,400, uh, plus another 400 for the check ride, plus another 700 uh, for the check ride fee. So $10,500. If you're going to do everything per part, um, part 61 as your initial rating. So we're looking at $10,500. Now let's let's look at the most common way though. So that's not how most people do it, right? They don't do their multi first. They do their single engine first. So let's let's think about your single engine. You're getting the 250 hours, right? And you're getting that on your way to private. You get to count all those hours, and then your instrument rating. You get to count all those hours, and so you, there's a little bit of time building that comes in. But as soon as you hit the 250 mark. Um, you'll basically be ready for the single engine check ride. So let's say you need five hours of kind of check ride getting ready and then the check ride itself. So I'll, I'll say $170 an hour for a single engine airplane plus another 60 for a, uh, um, instructor. So that's $230 an hour. I, these are kind of wild averages, but I think they're pretty close. So we'll just say $230 an hour. I think that's a little on the high side for training nationally. It might be a little cheaper uh, here in, in kind of the central United States, but it's probably more expensive on the coast. But anyway, we'll say $230 an hour with an instructor uh, times your five hours. That's uh, um, $1,100, so $1,150. And then the check ride is going to be uh, another $160 an hour rental plus, you know, for the, the flight itself, and then plus another... 600 so you're looking at we'll just round up and call it two thousand dollars for your single engine commercial well now as a commercial airplane single engine certificate holder you don't have to meet any training requirements so you can get the multi done in as little as two hours or three hours now realistically you're probably going to spend like i said about seven hours I, I give these ratings all over the country and i think seven hours is a solid answer so really you figure another hour for the check ride so another eight hours um so we, we said we're at two thousand dollars um for the single engine commercial because we're just doing that spin up remember you already did all your 250 hours in a single engine so now you're ready for your uh your add-on just those five hours so two thousand dollars um let's add in seven hours or eight hours of flying that includes the check ride at our 400 and well, we'll do 470 times 7 hours, plus another 400 for the check ride, plus another 700 for the check ride fee is 4390, plus 2000 is 6390. And you could even round up to 7000 or even $8,000. It's still $2,000 cheaper, conservatively. I would say probably more like $3,000 cheaper to do your single engine commercial first, followed by your multi-engine commercial. You're saving $3,000. So this is the real reason um, why people don't skip their single engine commercial. They get their single engine commercial first and then get their multi-engine commercial. is because back to what we were initially talking about, part 61, 63. So that's the reason, is it's a lot cheaper to add a class than it is to add a category. So really long story short, why do people get their single engine and then their multi-engine? Because it's cheaper for me to add a class than it is a category. So that's why. Uh, now in years past, you'll hear stories from maybe older pilots, a uh, little, probably a little bit older than me is, is kind of went out of vogue, but used to, you would take your private pilot in a single engine airplane, and then you would move and get your multi-engine private pilot rating and you would do the rest of your training in a multi-engine airplane. Uh, I, I believe ATP did that um, in probably the 90s or so. That was really popular for ATP. They would do all of your training basically in multi-engine aircraft. Now that might um, that might have worked out then but I think you know changing 
economics as far especially keeping a twin engineer plane flying trust me on this it's a hard thing to do multi-engineer craft are pretty expensive in fact let's that wouldn't hurt talking about this right now because the numbers i've been throwing out these are real world numbers in um 2022 why does it cost so much? Why is it so much more expensive for a multi-engineer craft? Well, let's let's think about the fleet first. What kind of multis do we have out there? Uh, most of them are old. So there's not a lot of new production multi-engineer craft coming off of uh, assembly lines. There's just not. Uh, Cessna no longer makes a piston twin anymore, and they haven't for a long time. Beechcraft makes maybe two or three barons a year. So and they're you know a million plus. Uh, Diamond makes uh, a twin. Uh, in fact, they make two different twins. Uh, I think it's the fifty-two and sixty-two or something. I'm not a Diamond aircraft flyer or, or know much about them. They're very expensive. Uh, they're both pushing. Uh, I think the trainer, the smaller version, is eight hundred thousand, something like that. And then the the nicer versions over a million dollars. So extremely expensive um piper uh, is is making uh, a twin so there's the the piper seminole um i don't know how many they make per year but it's not very many and i know that a g1000 piper seminole is again seven to eight hundred thousand dollars so very expensive um they have two engines so they burn twice as much fuel as a single engine airplane so your fixed operating costs are are higher just because it's using more fuel, right? Uh, the other thing is none of these twins, and I, I, I left out the Technum. The Technum makes a twin. It's a, a Rotax twin. I think the the P two thousand six T. I don't have any experience with the Technum, and its fuel burns a little bit less, but it, it's still it's probably the cheapest new build aircraft. But just not a lot of them out there. So it's we're, I guess it's kind of a newer aircraft. Just not a lot of those in the in the training uh, fleet right now. At any rate, all of these aircraft cost twice as much as their single-engine planes to, to operate on a fixed-cost basis as far as fuel burn goes. Also, their, their fixed or really variable costs as maintenance is a lot higher than a single engine. It's more than just double, right? It's, um, in a, I guess in a perfect world, it wouldn't be double the cost. It would be, you know, maybe 150% of the cost. Because you have you know, you do have two engines to do inspections on, but you still just have one fuselage, right? And you have still just two wings out there. You know, it's, you don't have double of everything. It's just twice as many engines and associated gauges and controls. Um, however, most of the multi-engine fleet doesn't get flown as much, and planes generally just don't like to sit. They're also older. Uh, and also, most of these weren't built as training aircraft. Uh, in fact, uh, I left out the older, the Piper Aztec and Apache. The Piper and Aztec and Apache are apart from all of these other ones because they're the only ones that were really a clean sheet twin engine design. All these other planes, so the Seminole, it's just a twin engine Piper uh, Cherokee or Warrior, right? The Duchess is just a twin engine Beechcraft Sierra. The Baron is a twin engine Bonanza. So... None of them were purpose-built as twins, and I, I would argue that none of them really built as as training in mind. So any high-repetition training is going to be really hard on these airframes, uh, and it's just going to require a lot of maintenance to keep them going. They just, And also, they haven't been made in a long time, so they're older aircraft, and older aircraft in general are harder to maintain. So this is kind of my theory on why twin engine aircraft are so hard to find. First of all, they make up only about, let's say 10 to 15% of our training fleet are twin engine airplanes. So there's not as many of them. Uh, the flight schools that do have them, uh, they're kind of sitting in the back corner of the hangar. The single engine aircraft are going out and flying every day. They're the money makers, right? They're making all the revenue for the flight school. So if something goes wrong with the single engines, they become a priority, right? We have to get the single engines fixed because that's what our students need most of the time, and that's how we're making our money. Meanwhile, this twin engine aircraft back here, which is rare, it has an expensive part that's broken. We don't have the excess revenue to spend on this plane because after we spend that money, the expensive labor and parts on that plane, 
it's not like that plane's going to turn around and make us a bunch of revenue. It's going to continue to only be flown about 10% of our total flight hours because not many people, well, you don't need as many multi-engine hours as you do single engine hours, right? I, I would think the average pilot, by the time they show up at the airlines, they've spent 90% of their time in single engine air, airplanes and 10% of their time in a multi. So if you think about that from the other side of the table of the flight school owner, that means 90% of the revenue they made off of that student came from them flying a single engine airplane and the 10% came off the multi. So the cash flow part just isn't there. Um, it, and it's really hard to cash flow that, that multi, uh, multi-engine airplane and focus on it because you've got a plane that's now using a significant percentage of your maintenance budget, but it's not contributing a significant percentage of profit. So I speak, I'm, I'm talking a lot of ec- economics right now because I'm a flight school owner and I deal with these, uh, but that's what drives the industry to where it's at now. That's just, that's just the way it is. So here at VSL, we've kind of turned that on its head, and we don't we don't have any single engine airplanes. We lease one, just to have so our instructors have a little bit of extra flying they can do on the side with local students. But all of our aircraft are multi engine, so we kind of flip that over on its head, and now all we focus on is our multi engine airplanes, and that's great because this rating only takes about a week to accomplish. You can come in on a Monday, and leave by Friday or Saturday with your rating. And so you can afford to fly out here to central Arkansas, do your training with us in an accelerated format, uh, and then leave. And it works really well. That model really wouldn't work for like your initial commercial because your initial commercial might take uh, a month to get everything done. There's a lot, of, especially if you're not at your 250 hours yet. That takes quite some time and there's a written exam you have to take and um, there's a lot of variables in there. But when you're talking about your multi-engine add-on, there's no written required. Right, there's no training required by the FARs. It's trained to proficiency, uh, and the check ride itself is pretty straightforward. The ACS allows us to to eliminate a lot of the stuff and and do a shortened, abbreviated check ride. So that's what we're going to look at next. Are you nervous about an upcoming check ride? Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a designated pilot examiner? In this show, I give you a behind the scenes look of the FAA check ride process. I'll show you best practices on how to have a successful check ride, common errors that applicants struggle with, and share with you some of the valuable knowledge I've gained throughout my 15 year career in military and civilian aviation. For more information about the show, visit our website, vsl.aero slash podcast. There you'll find the show library, various ways to support the show, and links to purchase our interactive airman certification standards study guide. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. And most importantly, tell your aviation friends about the show. This is listener-supported content, and I plan on keeping it that way. So any way you can support the show through Patreon or PayPal is greatly appreciated. Consider how much you would normally pay for an hour of ground school with an experienced CFI. Thanks for listening, and back to the show. Here I've got my uh, interactive commercial ACS pulled up, and on the main page I have a link for the multi-add-on. And that takes you back to the appendix section. I believe it's, uh, let's find the actual appendix number. What is it? In appendix 5. So appendix 5 has all of our additional rating task tables. So you can see that there's multiple of these. There's uh, an additional rating task table for the following. Addition of an airplane single engine land rating to an existing commercial. Uh, an addition of an airplane single engine C rating. Addition of an airplane multi-engine land rating. Addition of an airplane multi-engine C rating. So those are the four additional task table ratings. So the most common one is the addition of a multi-engine land rating. So we can see right here, uh, we... Here's the title, Addition of an Airplane Multi-Engine Land Rating to an Existing Commercial Pilot Certificate. So we have an existing commercial pilot certificate. That's our single engine land rating, right? And so that's where we enter the table is this column is this airplane single engine land. So that's the rating we currently hold. And then to our left here, these are the areas of operation. And then in the table itself, this is the actual tasks within that area of operation that we have to do. So in task one, we have to do F and G. So task one, if you remember back from my my previous episodes on the ACS, area of operation one is our pre-flight preparation. That's really where I construct the oral exam out of, or any examiner is going to construct their oral exam out of area of operation one. 
So instead of going through all of that, right, you're, uh, let's, let's look back. I, I don't have to do, um, in area of operation one, our pilot qualifications, our aircraft, our aircraft certification, our weather, our, um, you know, uh, cross country navigation. I don't have to do any of that. All I have to do is tasks F and G, which is performance and limitations. So that's the first one. And then the next one is task G, which is operations of systems. So during the oral, at a minimum, I have to cover task F, uh, performance limitations, and G, operations of systems. So within those uh, performance and limitations, there's two skill areas. So remember, you have to do one knowledge item, one risk management item, and all of the skills. So two skills that we have to do. And then uh, operations of systems, we have to do uh, two skills there. But skill one is operate at least three of the systems in the knowledge area above. So uh, during the oral, I'll ask you about three systems of a multi-engineer craft. And typically, it's going to be three systems that I know that are different than most single engineer craft. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, and then we'll go back to performance limitations. What systems are different in a multi-engineer plane? The first one that comes to mind is the fuel system. So the, the fuel system is different in a multi-engineer plane because all multi-engineer planes, uh, at least that I've seen, have the capacity to cross-feed. So basically I can run my right engine off of the fuel in my left tank and vice versa. So this capability is, uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward on how to use it, but the question I ask is why do you have that capability, right? If I lose an engine... I want to land. And in the lower 48 states, you know, if I'm not over water or, or not in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, I can pretty much be assured that I'm within about 30 minutes of an airport at any given time. There might be a few remote areas in the country, I'm sure, where you're a little bit lo longer than 30 minutes away from an airport. But uh, especially down here in the southeast United States, I mean, there's you can't swing a dead cat around without hitting an airport. They're everywhere. So why would I be flying for an extended period of time so much so that I would need to cross feed to make it? Um, why do I have that capability? Well, the reason actually uh, is back when these planes were designed, there weren't instrument approaches everywhere, right? So if you were en route in instrument meteorological conditions and you lose your engine, you might be a couple of hours away from the nearest airport with an appropriate instrument approach to get you out of that IMC condition, right? So we don't have that same problem today, but we do have a problem of if you're in a light piston twin, which a light piston twin would be anything that weighs less than 6,000 pounds, uh, but if you're in a light piston twin and you lose an engine in IMC conditions, I'm going to start flying to an airport that has probably at least circling minimums or or higher. That would be my minimums that I want to shoot an approach to. Because if I'm shooting an approach on a single engine and I, I get down to 200 feet on an ILS and I have to go missed, well, the single engine, uh, the single engine performance of a light twin isn't guaranteed, right? It's, it's not a sure thing. In fact, most of the time it's really, really bad. Uh, sometimes in the summertime, it can even be not positive, uh, climb at all. Even with full power on the operating engine, if the left engine or, or either one of the engines are inoperative and you're at a heavier weight and it's uh, it's hotter conditions, there's a good chance you might not be able to climb, period. So now you're down here at 200 feet above the ground in IMC conditions having to try to go missed. And that's a very, you know, that could be a significant emotional event. We'll put it that way. Uh, something that I want to avoid. So what I would do is I would set up cross feed and I would fly for two or three hours to get to an airport that had really good weather where I'm guaranteed I can shoot an approach and get down without having to worry about going missed. So fuel system, that's a system that's different than a single. The next one is the landing gear. Uh, many of the students that come through VSL for their multi-engine rating do not even have their complex rating anymore. This is kind of a an emergent thing uh, that didn't used to happen because used to, to get your commercial, you had to have 10 hours of training in a complex airplane. And even in the check ride, you had to do the check ride in a complex airplane. Well, that since about five years ago, there's no longer the case. So what happens now is a lot of, I would say most flight schools are giving all their commercial students, all their training in technically advanced aircraft that are not complex. So think of a G1000, 172. 
So they qualify for their commercial rating using the TAA rule. They never get a complex rating, and they show up here to VSL, and it's the first time that they've ever swung gear. So talking about the landing gear system is something we do a lot here, specifically with the students that don't have any complex time. So if you don't have your complex rating, you can still get your uh, multi-commercial add-on, and no, you don't have to have your complex rating before you show up. We'll do your complex rating while you're here, um, but that's just something to, to, to consider there. Um, you, you're going to have to study on the systems a little bit more than you would usually. So uh, that's the second system. I would say the, the third system is the full feathering uh, propeller. So in a single engine aircraft, the propeller, uh, a, a constant speed propeller, uh, always basically wants to go as fast as possible. And if you remove oil pressure from it, it's going to spin as fast as it can, right? Well, in a twin engine aircraft, if you lose oil pressure, the prop wants to go as slow as possible and stop, or what's called feather. So it'll actually stop moving, uh, and, and the engine will be completely secure and it'll be off. You might have seen videos of it or something, but it's called a feathered propeller. So a full feathering propeller is actually a, kind of a, it's not different completely than a single engine governing system or constant, uh, constant speed propeller but it kind of works in the opposite, right? So in your single engine, let's say you're flying a, um, let's say you're flying a 182. 182, constant speed propeller. When you uh, make the prop spin faster, you're opening the, the pilot valve and allowing oil to escape from the propeller hub and the, the prop spins faster. When you're in a Beechcraft Travel Air uh, that has a constant speed propeller, and you move the prop lever forward to make the, the prop spin faster, you're sending oil to the propeller hub and uh, allowing uh, or forcing the, the pitch uh, of the blades to go into a fine pitch or, or spin faster, so a faster condition. So if you lose oil pressure, catastrophic oil pressure in a twin engine aircraft would cause the propeller to automatically feather back and, and it would shut off. Whereas if you were in a single engine airplane and you had a catastrophic loss of oil pressure, the propeller would go uh, go to fine pitch and spin very fast, and eventually your engine would seize and stop moving as well. But the reason we want the propeller to feather in a, in a twin engine airplane is because if it doesn't feather in a twin engine airplane, it's out there creating an immense amount of drag, and so much so that our remaining engine can't keep us airborne anymore. So we want that engine to feather automatically. That way, the engine that we have remaining can keep us safely airborne in most cases. Uh, I would say there's maybe 40% of the country during the summertime that in a light twin, you, you're probably in a forced landing condition much as you would be in a 172. And what I mean by that is even after you've feathered and removed all drag, your full power on your remaining engine, you don't have enough performance to stay airborne. You're in kind of this powered glide situation. Um, and, and that's because of something called your absolute ceiling. So that kind of takes us to, uh, we'll go back to our performance and limitations. We're going to talk about absolute single engine ceiling and our single engine service ceiling. So those two numbers are something that you've never dealt with in a single engine aircraft. So your single engine service ceiling, that's the, the service ceiling where with one engine, you can continue or hold a 50 foot a minute climb. Your single engine absolute ceiling is the ceiling you can hold at zero foot a minute climb. Uh, another way to think about your single engine absolute ceiling is to really think of it as a drift down altitude. So in the travel air, for instance, it's about 8,000 feet. So if I'm at 10,000 feet and I'll lose my engine, I will drift down slowly until I can maintain 8,000. Well, the, the issue here is what if I'm over the Rocky Mountains and there's terrain at 9,000? Well, I'm going to drift down until I land basically or hit terrain so i'm in a forced landing condition in that scenario whereas here in arkansas even in the summer you know density altitude might be three or four thousand feet if i lose my engine up at ten thousand well i'm going to sink down to eight thousand and then i'll be able to hold eight thousand and i can fly around as long as i can using cross feet or whatever until i run out of fuel and then i'm you know then i would be forced to land but basically i can fly to an airport of my choosing within my fuel range and do a single engine landing successfully uh, but you could be in a condition, like I said, in a mountainous terrain uh, during the summertime specifically where you're going to be in a forced landing condition. So that's a new performance number 
that you'll have to discuss. Uh, another performance number is your accelerate stop distance. Um, a lot of people refer to this as accelerated stop, accelerated stop. It kind of bugs me because that's not a thing. It's accelerate and stop. So accelerate stop distance. So accelerate hyphen stop. I'll put that up on the screen here. But accelerate stop is the distance uh, that you travel from brake release to acceleration, rotate speed or decision speed, and then this the distance it takes you to go from rotate speed or your decision speed to stop. So you add those two, the acceleration and the deceleration, you add those together and that's your accelerate stop distance. So that's a number that we want to know to make sure that our accelerate stop distance fits on the runway that we're using for takeoff. If it doesn't, then we need to make some changes. We either need to change our weight uh, or uh, we might need to change the speed at which we decide to start our stop. That's a bad way of putting it. Uh, uh, the decision speed that we decide to reject the takeoff there. That's probably a better phrase. Um, so if we make the decision at rotate and that gives us an accelerate stop distance of 4,000 feet, let's say we're just throwing out numbers here and we want to take off from a 3,000 foot runway. Well, then we might need to back off our decision speed to 75 knots. So now once we pass 75 knots, now we're committed to going no matter what happens. And if an engine fails, we're, we're going to continue going. But if an engine fails before 70 knots, we're going to stop and we'll know that we'll be able to stop in the distance remaining. So that thing that I just mentioned there of reaching an airspeed where you're deciding to go, that would be called our accelerate go distance. Now, in a single-engine piston twin, the accelerate-go distance is going to be, as a rule, always longer than your accelerate-stop distance. And that's because uh, a twin-engine piston uh, doesn't have a lot of excess thrust. So if you take one of its engines away, uh, it's losing 50% of its power, and it's losing about 80% of its performance because performance is a function of excess thrust, right? So... It's not just a function of, of uh, the number of engines that you have. So in other words, if I, add, if I have one engine and I have, uh, let's say, a power of 10, and I add a second engine, doesn't mean that I'm going to have a power of 20. Um, because that second engine is also causing um, extra drag, right? It's adding weight. So it's not a one-to-one -one, um function. You know, it's not directly correlated like that. So just because I have two engine doesn't mean that I have twice the performance. Uh, it really only means I've, I've got about 20% of excess performance over a single engine airplane. So when I lose that extra engine, I'm losing 80% of my performance. It's a lot. So trying to continue an acceleration and climb out on a single engine when one engine has failed is going to take you a really long time. So you might see accelerate stop distance of 4,000 feet and an accelerate go distance of 12,000 feet. It's going to be really long. Uh, now, as you scale up and you get to transport category aircraft, well, for one, they're certified at a different level. So once you get over 6,000 pounds, now the government requires you to build that aircraft where it does have single engine performance. So when you lose an engine, you're guaranteed to be able to continue to, to fly safely or you're guaranteed to be able to stop on the runway remaining you're never in an area where that's an at in any doubt at all right so you're never in this kind of no man's land where it's you're too fast to stop and you're you don't have enough performance to go that's not acceptable for the airlines and you've never flown in an airliner uh, where that was the case they're always able to either stop on the remaining runway or continue safely on one engine because they have a lot of excess thrust uh, because of their, their turbo fans or turbo props. So a lot of excess thrust is there. Um, let's see, any other performance limitations? Weight and balance, um, it could be a little different. Most uh, light twins are going to have an extra baggage compartment in the nose. So you might have your flight examiner ask you, well, how, you know, maybe give you an out of balance problem where there's too much baggage for the rear baggage compartment. I might either have to bump that baggage or maybe I can move it up to the nose baggage compartment to try to balance out the load a little bit better. Uh, so, so that might be in there having to figure a, uh, a new weight and balance profile. And that's one of the skills required is compute the weight and balance and correct out of uh, center of gravity. So that's actually in there as a required item that you do. And then utilize the appropriate airplane manufacturer approved uh, performance charts, tables, and data. 
So those are the two performance items we're going to have to do. Back to the operations of systems. Again, we're going to cover three of those systems. I've already talked about three of the common ones that I ask. Uh, another uh, common one to ask about is the electrical system. And this could be different depending on the plane that you're flying. First of all, a lot of twins are 24-volt systems. But a lot of singles nowadays are 24 volt as well. So that could be a difference, 12 and 24 volt systems. Uh, the other thing that could be different about a twin is you might have twins that have two alternators. And you, there are some twins out there that only have an alternator on one of the engines. So that would bring up a discussion of, okay, if I lost my left engine, and I'll use the Piper Aztec because I do a lot of flying in the Aztec. The Aztec from the factory had a uh, hydraulic pump on the left engine and a generator on the right engine. So if you lost your left engine, that's your critical engine, uh, as well as being the one with your hydraulic pump. So now you're going to have to manually pump the, the gear and flaps. Uh, whereas if you lost your right engine, that's not non-critical engine, but then you lost your generator, so you're off battery power and you're going to have to land or um, risk, the, um, risk the chances of running out of le uh, electrical power. A lot of modern twins and even the Aztecs have been upgraded where they have alternators on both engines. Thankfully, that's a good idea. But even the uh, most Aztecs, I would say now, still just have a hydraulic um, pump on the left engine. So if you lose the left engine, it's a complex emergency because now you have an engine that's out, but you also are going to be forced to manually extend the gear and flaps. So that would definitely be a systems discussion that I have in a plane like the Aztec. All right, back to our multi-engine requirements. Um, area of operation two, this is our pre-flight procedures. So we can see here we have to do A, B, C, D, and F. So there's A, B, uh, well, I'll read through these since you're, if you're listening, A is pre-flight assessment, B is flight deck management, C is engine starting, D is taxiing, uh, E is taxiing and sailing, so that's a seaplane activity only, and then F is before takeoff checks. So from area of operation two, we only don't have to do one task, and that's the seaplane task, which makes sense because we're not doing this in a seaplane. Area of operation three, we don't have to do any of those activities. So area of operation three and uh, six, eight, and 11. Those are the areas of operation that we don't have to do at all. So area of operation four, we have to do, um, well, let's go back here. We have to do A, B, E, and F. So we have to do four of the takeoff requirements. So let's read through those real quick. I'm not going to go, I've already covered these in my commercial. Uh, and so if you've listened to those, um, there, there's nothing that's changed. I, I think we are adding one new one, and we'll, we'll see that here pretty shortly. So we're going to do a normal takeoff, uh, a normal approach and climb. We're not doing soft field. So let's talk about soft field for a second. One of our performance numbers that we're going to discuss uh, is VMC, and that's our uh, min control speed. So that's the speed that if we go lower than that, we're not going to be able to maintain directional control of the airplane during a specific configuration. And that specific configuration broadly is with my uh, critical engine failed in windmilling, my operative engine at full power. So in that configuration, if we get below VMC, we're not going to be able to control the airplane. As a rule, you never want to be in the air below VMC uh, with the power in in a multi, right? So that let's let me explain that. So during takeoff, if you have full power in, and you do a soft field technique where you pull back on the yoke and you let the airplane get airborne as soon as it can, well, it's going to lift off pretty soon because it's got a lot of excess thrust right now because both engines are working. But let's say you get airborne at 50 knots, VMC is at 80 and you lose an engine at 50 knots, you're so far below VMC that you're immediately going to go into a really hard slip into that dead engine. You're going to try to correct with aileron, and you're probably going to stall the dead engine wing, and you're going to spin. So that's the, the videos you see of the twin taking off and immediately rolling over on its back. That's just a low-level spin. And if we do a soft field uh, takeoff, and we get into that scenario that that would be opening us up for a very bad outcome. So we don't do soft field takeoffs or soft field landings in a multi-engine airplane. So that's not required. Uh, and you can see that the soft field tasks say ASEL in parentheses. That means they're only airplane single engine land. So we do A, B. We skip C and D. 
we do short field. So E and F is our short field takeoff and short field approach. And that's for airplane multi-engine land as well as airplane single engine land. So we do both of those. Uh, the, the remainder tasks are for uh, seaplanes only. So nothing new there. We're doing a normal takeoff and landing and a short field takeoff and landing. All right. Area of operation five, steep turns. We only have to do area of operation or task A, which is steep turns. So that's our performance and ground reference maneuvers area of operation. We have to do task A, only one, steep turns. Uh, area of operation seven, this is our maneuvering during slow flight. We have to do all of those. So all the, uh, sorry, that's not, uh, that's slow flight and stalls area of operation. So not the slow flight area operation, the slow flight and stalls. We have to do all the slow flight and stalls maneuvers that you did in, as a single engine. You have to do those in a multi as well. All right. We are in area of operation nine. This is emergency operations. Um, if you remember back to our commercial uh, single engine, we had a couple of these that we didn't talk about. And uh, that's because they were airplane multi-engine only. So that's where they come in is our emergency operations. And then uh, our next area of operation, which I'm going to, I'm going to hold off for now is area of operation 10. That's our multi-engine operations. So we're going to save that for the next episode. I've already been going for almost an hour now. So I'm going to cut that off here in the next episode. We're going to cover area of operation nine and 10. So finish up the ACS discussion and then the things that I've mentioned today about uh, min control speed and multi-engine aerodynamics, we're going to have a more in-depth discussion about those because there's some maneuvers in there that directly relate to those principles. Um, so hopefully that'll be more of kind of a, an intro to multi-engine flying. Uh, but for now, we covered the training. Uh, we covered the beginning parts of the ACS. So hopefully you have a better idea of when you need to get your multi-engine rating and kind of the first steps in, uh, into doing that and kind of what a check ride is going to look like. So on the next episode, we'll, we'll cover the rest of the ACS and then go into that uh, more aerodynamic discussion about multi-engine principles. So I hope you found it useful. Thank you so much for the feedback. Uh, I love the comments in YouTube. Uh, I would love some feedback on, um, on Apple Podcasts. So if you can give a five-star review, leave a feedback, say something about the show, tell me you like it, tell me you're listening out there. I hope you are. Uh, but those of you that have uh, donated on Patreon uh, or PayPal or bought the Airman Certification Standards, I really, really appreciate it. I know flying is expensive, uh, and I, I really appreciate that you're willing to uh, support the show uh, in any way you can. And if you're if you're new to flying, don't feel obligated to to give me money. If you're if you have the means to do it, please consider it. But if you don't have the means, if, if you giving me uh, $20 is meaning that you're going to have to skip a flight or not be able to uh, get ready for the check ride like you wanted to, then don't give me your money. S save your money for flying. I want you to invest that in you and your flying. But if you're in a place with your training or your career where you have a little bit of extra money, you know, like I said uh, in, in the middle of show bump and, and earlier, you know, consider what you would pay a uh, really experienced instructor, which I am. I've got years of experience, thousands of hours of dual given, over a thousand check rides given. So, you know, consider how much you would pay me to sit down and instruct you for an hour. Um, just consider. So I really appreciate it. I'll stop asking for money. I don't want to sound like an NPR station here. Uh, I hope you all enjoy it and I'll talk to you next time. See ya.